Uh, when it comes to lifespan, there really are four big elephants in the room. The first is, is atherosclerosis. Just no matter how you cut the data, more people are going to die from cardiovascular disease than anything else. Cancer is number two, pretty much consistently in the same boat. Then you get into neurodegenerative diseases. And a lot of this roots back to metabolic health. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because I kind of got distracted when you first asked me about the four horsemen. I forgot that one. Once you have type 2 diabetes, your risk of those other diseases doubles. And the challenge is, you know, in some ways, these are the hardest things to fix because it comes down a lot to exercise, nutrition, and sleep. You have to manage nutrient. You have to be exercising. I mean, there is simply no better elixir for metabolic health, fuel partitioning, glucose disposal than being active. And if your sleep is dysregulated, it's almost impossible to overcome it with enough exercise and nutrition. With gratitude, optimism is sustainable. And, and it just hit me. That's it. If I can find gratitude in whatever I do, in whatever, I, whatever situation I'm in, if I can find one little thing to be grateful for, then it reverses the whole situation. It allows for the possibility of, of, of grace, of something fantastic happening. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to episode number 165 of our State of Fitness. Today is March 29th, right? Not March 29th, 2023. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you're doing well. If this is your first time joining us, as always, I'm David Greenwald. I'm the founder of Leanness Lifestyle University. For 24 years and counting, we've been using science and experience uh, to help our clients lose the excess one more time for the last time so that they can live their best lives with the fitness and the body they desire. Uh, for first timers, each Wednesday, I do this thing called the state of fitness like I'm doing right now, I'm moving some stuff around on my screen here so I can see what's going on. Um, state of fitness, every Wednesday, I cover anything weight oriented, fitness oriented, anything top of mind that's fitness or weight management oriented for the week. Uh, this state of fitness is my 165th in a row since February 5th, 2020. You know, it's funny, I kind of blow past that on, on most of these, but February 5th, 2020, if you think about that date, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know the pandemic was coming. And I've told the story before, but just real quick, just for uh, somebody that may be new. When I started that, I had not done really any Facebook Lives. And I was doing these live on Facebook. I do them on YouTube. This was on YouTube. I don't know how you're seeing this. If you're seeing this live, you're seeing me on YouTube. If you're seeing this as a recording, I don't know where you're seeing it, but you're probably seeing it on YouTube. But I used to do Facebook Lives, same way, same format. But I hadn't done them. And I promised the group that was in uh, a cohort, uh, a class that was 18 weeks, I promised them for this cohort where we had a couple hundred people all starting together and they would all finish together. They all started February 5th, 2020. And I promised them five lives. I didn't want to over, you know, over promise and under deliver. So I, I thought I will promise them five and we'll see what happens. By the time that fifth one came, if you think about it, we were just starting that second week, March, 2020 pandemic was here. We didn't know exactly what it was. Things were very, starting to become unnerving, deaths were increasing, um, lots of stuff going on that we're all very familiar with and that had us all going, what is going on? What is this thing? We didn't know if it'd be gone by summer. We didn't know if it was going to be a few months. We didn't know what it was going to be. But I knew at the end of that five weeks of doing a Facebook Live each week that there was no way I could abandon the group. Um, we specialize, I would say, in emotional fitness. And as a part of emotional fitness, you know, it's about having the tools and strategies to better manage life, having the tools and strategies to better manage anxiety, to better manage the strife that hits us every single day. And I thought, there's just no way I can, I can leave this group where they are. It's, we're all too, wow, what is, what is this? So, that's what started it though, February 5th, 2020. And I did, and I just con continued on. And I focused a lot on everything from, you know, uh, resilience and all of the elements of emotional fitness, focus, gratitude, compassion, 
sleep, stress management, um, uh, uh, I, I said compassion, but uh, control and serenity and nutrition and exercise and um, fun and novelty and just all of the things that go into helping us be a stronger person on the inside so that we can better manage whatever's going on on the outside. So anyway, I'll leave it there, but I'll just say that here we are now 165 Wednesdays later, and so far, knock on wood, I haven't missed a Wednesday since February 5th, 2020. So that's kind of what started this. That's how we ended up here, and here we are for number 165 on March 29th, 2023. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, YouTube channel and you like what you're seeing here, you get some value out of this, uh, please uh, like and subscribe. It'll help you stay in the loop. You won't be bombarded with anything. You kind of know how uh, YouTube works. Let's start off by taking a quick look at some of our top students for the week. We like to do that, highlight them, and then uh, we'll go into what I've got for you tonight. Okay? Let's see if this works. Yay! All right. So on campus, on our within our on-campus members area, there are behaviors, right? There are things to do, and we like to make sure that our students know what to do and that we help them organize what to do and in what order uh, so that we can make sense and help them make sense of everything that is uh, we have found to be helpful in these uh, 20 some years that we've been online to achieve the goal of losing the excess one more time for the last time. So these students have averaged at least 100 points or real close to 100 points per day for the last seven days. So we know what to evaluate and we score it uh, so the students can kind of keep tabs and keep track of, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I doing it enough? Am I hitting all of the elements that uh, you know, Coach Dave and crew have found to be helpful for success. All these students are doing that, and congratulations to everyone who's made the list. Special congratulations to Nikki, who hit a perfect 149-point average. The max points you can hit in a day um, is 149, unless you hit a goal on a certain day, which you get a 10-point bump for that. All right, so congratulations to everybody here. Uh, pounds lost in the last six weeks. All of these students have lost at least eight pounds in the last six weeks. So congratulations to everyone who's made this list. Um, and the top five students for this week are Renee at 12.6 pounds gone, Christina at 15.5, Paulette at 15.8, Kim at 17.4, and Matthew at 19 pounds gone in the last six weeks. Way to go, everybody. For percent of weight lost in the last six weeks, all of these students have lost at least 4% of their weight as of six weeks ago. And the top five students this week are Christina at 6.2%, Walker at 6.5%, Marilyn at 7.8%, Paulette at 7.9%, and Sarah at 8%. Let's just keep something in mind here because I normally blow past this too. First of all, outstanding job, everyone. Congratulations on making the list. But then I just kind of blow past it. Just as a reminder, from a scientific, from an evidence-based perspective, it's substantial, it's medically relevant, it's health scientifically uh, founded improving when you hit about 5% of your excess weight lost. These students just in the last six weeks have lost at least 4% just in the last six weeks. So. Again, once you hit, you know, any weight loss is good. Once the behaviors start, we start to see improvement in a number of things, a number of metrics, everything from mindset to, you could see a, a quick uh, reduction in blood pressure. Um, there are a number of things that improve right away, but as far as scientifically measured, validated, researched as relevant, it becomes medically relevant when you've lost just 5% of your excess. So, you know, it's it's no small thing that just in the last six weeks, these students have lost 4% of their excess from where they were six weeks ago. So it's worth mentioning. All right, good job, everybody. This list is, as I say, is to me, it's the list that I think everyone should strive to be on. 
This is our maintainers list. All of these students have achieved their lifetime goal and they've maintained uh, their lifetime goal within 10 pounds for the number of days you see in the days column. So they've kept off the amount of weight you see in the weight loss column. So congratulations to everyone on this list. You exemplify what just about everybody here has come here to do, which is again, lose the excess one more time for the last time. The students in green have kept their weight off now for at least a year, at least 365 days. And they are what we call master's candidates. You earn your master's, they already have their bachelor's. You earn your master's when you've kept off your weight within 10 pounds for two consecutive years. The reason we have two consecutive years as a benchmark for the master's level recognition is because at two years, my real world experience 30 years in and the research are in nice alignment, which is a really refreshing thing and not always the most common. But it's really refreshing um, and it's they're in alignment in that people that maintain their weight within that 10 pounds-ish for two consecutive years have about a 60% chance of keeping it off for life. I know we wish it was higher, but it's about 60% when you hit two consecutive years. So the students in green are striving for that. The students in orange, they're on their way to that. The students in orange have already done that. They have already earned their masters. They've already kept their weight off for two or more consecutive years. Um, and so for, I should say for greater than or equal to two years, less than four years. The students in orange have kept it off for greater than or equal to two years and less than four years. So they've already earned their masters. The students in blue, oh, by the way, the students in orange are PhD candidates. And the students in blue have earned the PhD recognition, body composition. So they have kept their weight off for four consecutive years or longer. And what the research says on that, which again matches my real world experience very well, is if you've kept the weight off for four consecutive years, you stand about an 80% chance of keeping it off for life. Which kind of begs the question, right? You think, oh my God, at four years, you know, I'm still not 100%. When am I 100%? Really not till the very end, you know? Maybe, maybe well into your 70s. Maybe well into your 70s, if you kept the weight off until then, you probably, you don't have a 100% chance of keeping it off, but you're probably well into the upper 90s by that point. So a huge congratulations to all of these students for showing everyone that it can be done. All of these students are currently active. They're currently enrolled. Um, so these are active, currently enrolled students. And uh, just congratulations, everyone. And, and thanks for allowing me to brag on you a little bit and, and showing everyone that it can be done. And you can see the ranges of weight loss, right? From, you know, just a few pounds to 150 pounds for more than a thousand days. I mean, it's really, really something. All right. Okay. So as, as preparation for this particular state of fitness went, it went sideways in a bunch of different ways. And that's because some of the research I was doing for a topic that I wanted to cover tonight just took me down some rabbit holes that I hadn't intended. Now, you would think 165 episodes in, I just have it nailed. Um, this is just one of those where I've got, I've got good material, but I'm going to ad lib a bit and I'm going to wait to present that this other subject so that I don't do it in injustice by giving it to you two thirds prepped, two thirds with, you know, with the slides right. And I just want it right. I think it's a really good, powerful subject. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I'll give it to you next week because I'll have a lot more time to, to give it to you. I was going to give it to you with what I had, but I'm not going to do that. So that was going to be a big chunk of tonight. So we're, there's still material, on, but I'm going to ad lib a little bit because there's always stuff on my mind that I want to discuss. But this is just going to be a bit of this is just going to be me just talking to you with some things that are kind of on my mind from notes that I've made, from thoughts that I've had you know, over the last few days or even weeks. Okay. And then I've got a subject that I did, um, you know, kind of lay out, you know, with the slides and everything. And it's, it's all, you know, reasonably polished and, and ready to go. So just kind of starting off something that's been on my mind that I haven't discussed is just kind of the aspect of paradigms in our stories. We've all got stories that we tell ourselves and we have to be careful uh, I've gone more in depth into it in the past and, and I'm not going to do that now, but I just want to just talk about it a little bit. We've all got stories that we tell ourselves, you know, I'm just 
no good at, or I'm really good at, or something that I just always struggle with is this. Something I can never seem to get around is this. A limitation that I just have, it just is, is this. And sometimes those stories are real, and sometimes they're interpretations that we've made about life events or about where we are. They're more paradigm-based um, than they are reality. Someone says, listen, I just can't jump over a tall building. Got it. That's a story that's real. I can get behind that. Uh, none of us can do that. But there are a number of stories and kind of paradigms, how we see the world, how we see this venture with transformation, that are limitations more than they are true, factual, inability to do something or to change or to adopt a new philosophy, um, a new approach. And so just something that, you know, I, I, I laughed at myself because I had a student who was, uh, says, hey, I need some help. I'm, I'm at work. I'm constantly surrounded by food. And of course, we're just using food in quotes because it's always going to be processed junk. So it's ultra processed food, but let's just use food for, for the sake of this discussion. Always surrounded by it. The, the smell of it is just overwhelming. And then the stress of work and on and on and on. And then people are food pushers as well. And they come up and they, they will tempt me with things and push things onto me. And there's things always around. What should I do? Well, there isn't necessarily always an easy answer, but the answer I gave just because of the way it was worded, and I'm not giving you the exact wording, but just trust, if you will, that when I gave the answer, if I said, well, could you bring, you know, let's say, let's say the uh, suggestion isn't going to be just stop at all costs, make sure you, you don't eat anything. Um, and with that not being the suggestion, instead, my suggestion was, what if you bring, you know, snap peas? celery, baby carrots, radishes, things that you can munch on, but that are so calorically low, their impact to your day for sabotaging things is going to be incredibly negligible or close to zero, especially if you just kind of plan them in. You say, hey, at work, part of my plan is I'm going to have, you know, whatever, 200 calories of this stuff, these vegetables that you just kind of chew on, you munch on, gives you something to eat. Other people are eating around you. You can kind of sort of fit in um, as we have a tendency to need to do. And so I, I, I gave that kind of simple answer and I asked the question, I said, do we just solve this? And she wrote back, you know, it was, it was kind of cute. She wrote back and she was more like, you know, the palm to the forehead, kind of like, why didn't I think of that? And so for you know, a little bit, I can kind of be like, that was simple. You know, and um, from this chair, it was simple. But, you know, when I'm the one in the chair, and when I'm the one on the other side and it's me, um, it isn't, you know, it isn't always that way. So, again, paradigm stories. So, we just kind of, we just completed the CrossFit Open. The CrossFit Open is done by three, four hundred thousand people worldwide. You're in age divisions. There is RX, which is as prescribed. There is scaled, which is a level down. There's foundations, which, which is another level down. So there's kind of something for everyone, every skill level. I do scaled. I don't do RX for my age division. I'm in the 55 to 59 age division. I look forward to it. I do CrossFit once a week. Um, I try to keep myself with an all-around level of fitness that would allow me to do it pretty well uh, in the scale division, not the RX. And uh, so... That, that's we just finished that uh, uh, just a, just a few weeks back. And for one of the workouts, it required uh, jump and rope. And I do single unders, not double unders. And so I don't do them much because they are high impact. Lots of pounding. Um, I don't like it on my low back, don't like it on my knees, don't like it on my feet. okay So I don't do it hardly at all throughout the year. I know that when I need to do it, I can do it. I'm not going to be great at it. I'll be okay. I'm going to have plenty of misses. I'll get through it. And But my thinking, kind of my paradigm, if you will, not, I don't know about a story, but more a paradigm was, you know, I don't do it because of the impact, the low back, the knees, the feet, that kind of thing. So I did the workout. It had, I think, all in 
300 single unders, something like that. Not all at once, but broken up into blah, blah, blah. Two, 300, something like that. And uh, the owner of the CrossFit gym that I go to was my judge and finished up. And so we had a little chat afterwards. And I said, jokingly, of course, I said, do you think I ought to maybe do single unders more than once a year? And I kind of chuckled. He knew I was kidding. And he said, well, maybe just for a few weeks before they open. That, <laughs> believe it or not, was the same answer, appropriate, that I gave our student who was trying to figure out what to eat at work. It hit me the same way. I was like, yeah, I could do that. I mean, I don't need to do them all year long, do them every week, pound, 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 you know, um, put myself in jeopardy or whatever, you know, of, of an injury. Because to me, it's always injury-free progression if we're going to have progression. Injury-free is always at the front of anything when it comes to training. That's the number one. Because once you get injured, you're, you're really set back. So that's, that's, I'm going to keep that paradigm because that, I think, is a, is a really good priority to have. But couldn't I do single unders a little bit? for the two or three weeks before the open, just to get reacclimated with it again. Honest to God, I hadn't picked up a rope until it was open um, workout time. I didn't do it. I didn't practice it at all. I just knew I could do it. I knew I would have some misses and I got through it. And that's exactly what happened. I had plenty of misses and it impacted my score in the end. I don't take it so seriously like it's some you know, life or death thing. But I could have done better. And he's right. And it was just... That simple. Just a change, just a shift. And in my head, I'm like, next year? And I'll probably do some throughout the year, here and there. But really, it's about getting reacclimated for me. It's about getting reacclimated in the short period before the open. I can do that. And I won't tear something up. So that was kind of, you know, part one on paradigm, you know, shift in my head. And it was, it was just the same as what I had told our student about bring snap peas, you know baby carrots, celery, that kind of stuff. Not hard, but again, when it's you, you don't always think of it. So uh, another, another one just related to the CrossFit Open was the last workout. I watched the, uh, the, pre the, uh, the announcement, which uh, CrossFit always does an announcement of the workout live, and I don't remember if I caught it live. I usually try to catch it on replay so I don't have to kind of wait for anything. Took it to where I wanted to take it, watched it, uh, and I thought to myself, I don't know if I'm going to finish this workout in the time cap. I, I don't. There will, be, there will be people in my class who do, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this at all. And there was a 12-minute time cap, I believe, for that last workout. And the, the, the stumbling block for me was going to be that the load that was going to be needed for a barbell snatch was heavier than I've been using. Um, I'm still kind of rehabbing um, a low back thing from, from years ago. I'm fine. I'm good. Don't, you know, it's not, I'm not asking for any sympathy, but I'm still rehabbing that. And, and some of it, a good part of it has been mental and I'm doing better. I'm feeling really good about it. But I really didn't start feeling better about it until about five months ago. And so I was real tentative on the weight that I had to use for snatches, which barbell snatches, you take the bar from the floor all the way above your head in one motion without stopping. It, doesn't, it can't stop anywhere. It can't stop at your hips. It can't stop at your, uh, the front rack position, your clavicle, front shoulder area. It can't stop. Once it takes off from the floor, it has to keep going until your arms are fully extended above your head, just in case you don't know what a snatch is. And I, that was what, would made me, was what made me nervous. I didn't know if I was going to be able to do that with where I was in my progression. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to finish the workout. Remember, that's, that's kind of the, my paradigm, my story. As it turned out, we were coming back, Mary and I were coming back from Florida. And I couldn't do the workout. I was doing the workouts in Florida. I did my first two open workouts in Florida while we were down there on a Friday. Did them on a Friday morning. I couldn't do that because we were traveling and what was going on. So I knew I was going to have to do the workout on Monday back here. So I did the workout on the Monday. What that did is it gave me time, which I didn't really have, to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scores that had already been turned in for the workout of men in my 55 to 59 age group scaled. 
And for me as a personal goal, I like to, if I can, I like to be on what I call page one of the, the leaderboard. Page one of the CrossFit Open leaderboard is there's 50 per page. And I ideally, you know, just a, a goal for myself is I like to be 50th or higher out of about 1,400 men. There's about 1,400 men in my division. And I like to be 50th or higher out of all those men. And so I'm looking, so now I can look at scores. And I'm like, well, let's see what my brothers are doing here. I look, and the 50th score for that workout that I didn't know if I was going to finish, it had a 12-minute time cap. The 50th score had a time. Not only did they finish, they had a time of about nine minutes for the 50th position. The first position of that workout, the guy finished it in five minutes and 41 seconds. 541. And I thought, holy. And then I was like, oh, okay, he's an outlier. Nope, the next guy did it in like 615. And then in six, and then six, and six, and seven, and seven, and right on down until that 50th position was sitting there at that nine minute mark. And I went, wow, I know where I'm at. I'm in that, I'm, I'm with those guys in that 50th, it could be 15th to 50th position, depending on the workout. I know that's where I'm at. And I'm like, okay, I, okay, if I can pick up that heavier load, that made me nervous to think about picking that up. If I can do that, I should be able to finish this workout somewhere under 10. I don't know, something like that. Just depends on how fast I can move that bar. My point with all of this is this. We've got to watch for the stories we tell ourselves. Had I not had the comparison to see what the other guys had done, my paradigm was, I don't even know if I'll finish. And had I gone into the workout not knowing what others had done, I can pretty well um, assure you that my score would have been worse than what it was. And I did finish that workout, I think, in 916. There's no way I would have finished that in 916 had I not known that it was possible. It's kind of like, you know, it's you can't run, you know, when, when people couldn't finish a mile in under four minutes, and then a guy did it, right? And then right on down the line, more and more and more and more people have done it. They saw that it could be done. That's how it, that's how it affected me. So how can, this, how can this help you? It's really just a story just to kind of tell you that I'm just as vulnerable as anybody else to it. Um, I still have to watch myself. And that's with all I know and trying to be cognizant, you know, as I continue to work with all of you. And that sometimes in this chair, it is easy. Uh, it really is sometimes quite easy to help, help you come up with the solution um, that you're looking for and that can be helpful for whatever we're trying to, you know, uh, accomplish. And uh, sometimes when I'm the one in the position, I don't see it. I don't see it myself. So it's kind of a, this was kind of a mix of paradigm and stories. But these are things that we, we really should watch for. We want to make sure we're not imposing limitations on ourselves by the story we continue to tell ourselves. We're just Something that you tell yourself all the time or frequently or something you believe about yourself that isn't eye color. You know, if it's eye color, my eyes are hazel. I can't change that unless I put in contacts. That's a fact. But other than things like that, that truly can't be changed, almost everything else can to a degree, to at least a degree. So watch for those paradigms. Watch for those stories. Okay. Um, and I've really been, been meaning to tell you guys, it's probably a good opportunity that this thing went sideways today so I could at least tell the story of kind of what happened to me with CrossFit and how it tied in with this because otherwise we were going to be, you know, six to nine months down the road in the open, be long history. So what I think I'll do is now I'm going to pop over uh, to uh, a topic that I have I've got prepared. We'll be good to go and uh, I'm going to send you guys on your way. All right, so let's see what's going on here. Give me a second. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this. Let me go back here. So the topic was going to be two topics. It is two topics, but the first one was just kind of ad-libbed, a little story time. The real first topic that was uh, totally prepped and ready to go for tonight uh, recently hit my radar. And you know what's funny is 30-some years into this, there's still things that will hit me that I'm like, did I know about that? 
was I aware of that? Is that new to me or did I forget it? I don't remember it. And this is one of those things. Um, so what is it? So what is this thing that I couldn't remember if it was new, couldn't remember if I forgot it, but I didn't remember it. So, you know, it was kind of like, you know, new to me now or a refresher to me now anyway. Um, but it's another tool to help you measure body composition. And I'll tell you why that matters, but it's a tool to help you measure body composition. And it's one that can shine a light on fat located around the abdomen, okay, the central area. I've talked in the past about body mass index, and I'm not going to be talking about it. That's not what I'm going to be talking about, but I at least have to mention it. So I'm not going to be talking about it except to mention that it's a primary calculation used to provide a general idea of body fatness, okay? The BMI calculation is weight in pounds divided by height in inches squared, and we never need to remember that calculation. We don't need to remember it because you can Google what's my BMI or BMI calculator and you'll find them galore when you do that, all right? But I just want to mention this and it'll make sense why I'm tying it in. So with body mass index BMI, we know that underweight is under 18.5 once the calculation is done. Normal or healthy is 18.5 to 24.5. Overweight is 25 to 29.9. Obese is 30 to 34.9, that's class 1 obesity. Uh, 35 to 39.9 is class 2 obesity. I don't even like that image anymore. That image, is, I don't like that image that I've got on there. But anyway, it'll show you the different body types. The numbers I'm giving you by voice are actual factual, okay? So 30 to 34.9 is class 1 obesity. 35 to 39.9 is class 2 obesity. And 40 plus is class 3 obesity, or also known as morbidly obese. So that's it for the BMI refresher. Okay, you know it's a calculation. You know that it's used as a gauge uh, to kind of dis, uh, to help us determine a general, very general uh, look at fatness. Okay, um, but what BMI doesn't do is it doesn't distinguish whether we have a lot of abdominal fat or not, and this can be important to know. Why? Because Abdominal or visceral fat obesity, that is fat internal, internal to our abdomen, okay, which is behind our abdominal muscles, okay, behind, behind the muscles. It, this, this fat, this visceral fat cannot be pinched with skin fold calipers. It's not where it's at. It's inside. It's around the organs. It pushes on and surrounds our organs, this fat is, this visceral fat. It's considered more metabolically active and associated with a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, metabolic disorders, and other health conditions. Visceral fat, is, we need some, but excess visceral fat, not good. So when we're talking about kind of uh, central obesity or uh, abdominal you know, obesity, Think about people who have more of an apple shape over a pear. And that doesn't mean just because you have an apple shape that you have excess visceral fat or you've got too much abdominal fat or too much central fat. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that at all. Just in thinking of shape, generally speaking, what the research has found is people who have a small waist, even if they have larger hips and thighs, the people that have a small waist, waist with larger hips and thighs, the fat, that fat distribution is not as dangerous as people who have a large waist with narrow hips and thighs. So the apple shape, it just kind of naturally is that way. Men typically, typically are more an apple shape. Men typically have a higher risk of those things I just showed you, including cardiovascular disease and so forth, because of the way that we distribute as men, the way we distribute our fat, that central uh, obesity or the, the central uh, deposition of fat to the abdominal area, especially when it goes visceral, meaning it gets in and around the organs. It's not the fat right underneath the skin. It's not subcutaneous fat. It's not fat you can pinch. Women can be apple shapes too, absolutely. Um, but men by and large are almost always or a really high percentage are, are apple shaped. Okay. So apple shapes versus pear shapes. So a simple tool, actually, it, it, what I'm going to share with you 
in this uh, episode is really a calculation, but it's beyond body mass index. Um, this calculation is a better predictor of disease risk and lifespan the, uh, because it measures the waist. And it's called the waist to height ratio. You probably guessed that by now by the title of this, right? The waist to height ratio. I know I was familiar with waist circumference. I know I was familiar with waist to hip ratio. I don't know if I was ever familiar with waist to height ratio. So the waist to height ratio has been studied extensively since the 90s. And it has been found to be a good predictor of disease risk very often, almost always, a better predictor of disease risk than straight body mass index. And it's calculated, it's nice things, it's got a nice simple calculation too. And it's calculated by dividing your waist circumference in inches by your height in inches. For example, if your waist circumference is 35 and your height is 5 feet 10, which is 70 inches, your waist to height ratio is 35 divided by 70, which is 0 0.50, okay? So let's watch Jessica from the American Council on Exercise show us how to properly measure the waist so you guys can do this right. Okay, give me one sec. Let's discuss a few simple ways that you can assess your health risk at home using nothing more than a tape measure. So for our purposes today, it's actually recommended that you utilize a spring-loaded tape measure like this one you see here. Now, if you don't have a spring-loaded tape measure at home, you can use one of these if you have that available. Waist circumference can be measured at the midpoint between the lowest rib and the iliac crest. Unsure what the iliac crest is? It essentially acts as the main hip bone. It can be felt by putting your hip at the lowest rib bones and simply sliding it down the abdomen until you reach the top of the pelvic region. Research has shown that waist circumference is effective in identifying cardiovascular disease and diabetes risk. For accuracy, you want to ensure that you're completing the measurement at the same landmark each time. It's also helpful to complete multiple measurements at the same site, but to ensure that you allow at least 20 to 30 seconds between repeat measurements to allow the skin and subcutaneous tissue to return to its normal state. Good job, Jessica. Um, so, as a general rule of thumb based on substantial research, the goal for the waist to height ratio uh, the goal of low risk of disease and negative impacts on longevity is to have a waist to height ratio of 0.55 or less for sure. However, in the UK and in some organizations here in the United States now, their uh, National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence recently suggested a ratio of 0 0.50 or less. So when I gave that example earlier, a waist of 35 inches, a height of 70 inches, that is 0 0.50. So you... Um, so you would be considered very low risk there. And as I have here on the screen, 0.55 indicates a low amount of abdominal fat, which when too high is often associated with an increased risk of health problems. So remember, um, the waist to height ratio, it's really simple, right? Just inches of your waist divided by height in inches, not even square, just height in inches. Uh, and that ratio will tell you what it is. And all you're shooting for, real simple, is you just want it. It's not like 0 0.3 is better than 0 0.4. 0 0.42 is better than... Th that's, that's not what I see in the research. They haven't like said for sure that this particular range is better than this. What they are saying, I think partially just to keep it simple, is they're just saying you want to strive for 0 0.50 or less. You want that waist to be, in inches, half or less the inches of your height. That's what we're looking for, ideal. Um, other, just so you know, just kind of refresher, waist circumference alone is a very, very common measure as well. Also has been found to uh, be valid for measuring risk of cardiovascular disease and so on and so forth. And what they typically say is for that, just that alone, women who have a waist circumference under 35, good to go. Men who have a waist circumference under 40, good to go. For just talking about waist, okay? So just in case you don't get a ratio that you like, if you don't get a ratio that isn't, doesn't fit perfectly in there, um, look at that as well. Um, look at the two. The thing is, this is, a, uh, this is another measure of what's called anthropometry. Anthropometry. Anthropometry is just look, are just things that evaluate proportion 
of the body, proportions of the body in some way, waist, height, anthropom anthropometry. Um, the waist circumference is another anthrop anthropometric, you know, measure. So that's what these are. Um, and, and just keep in mind that the waist to height ratio is a better predictor of health risk than uh, body mass index, or even just typically even better than just waist circumference alone. But remember, no one measurement is an end-all be-all. So don't get too down on yourself. If you have questions, if you do this yourself and you have questions about where you're at, maybe you're in maintenance and you find that you've got a waist to height ratio of 0.55, but you like where you're at and you're doing so many other things that are fitness oriented. You know, your nutrition's dialed in, your exercise is dialed in, your emotional fitness, you're continuing to work on it, you're managing life better and you're sitting there at a, you know, a 0.55 for whatever reason. Um, let's talk about it because that is, there's no end all be all here. There's no single measure that's going to tell us, well, we, we can tell what's going to happen there. Um, it may be something we want to do more about. It may not. It may not be anything we can do anything about. Now, if your body mass index is above 30 and you're obese, we can definitely do something about it. We want to get you out of the obesity zone. But knowing these things are good to know because we should at least be aware of these anthrop anthropometric uh, tools that are just really simple that have been validated. They've been researched for a long time. They've um, in, in really respected peer-reviewed journals and they, it correlates to either increases or decreases in the disease risk, cancers, you name it, okay? Um, and also, depending on where you are in your journey, you know, depending on other factors, maybe this is something that you can add to, uh, add to your why. Maybe it's something you wanna add to your why, you know, where you, you say, hey, one of the things I wanna do is I wanna have, I wanna get that ratio, you know? It's not gonna maybe be the most powerful part of your why, but maybe it's a factor. Maybe it's just another little thing where you're like, hey, it can be measured, I like that. It can, you know, it's objective. Um, it's not a subjective emotional type of measurement, it's objective. So uh, I would say just keep it in mind for possibly, you know, that benefit as well. All right, with that said, I know this is quite a bit different than normal, but hey, uh, that's how it goes sometimes. We're still here. I'm still rooting for y'all. You guys all know, as we conclude this, if you need any help, reach out to me. Find me on campus. If you're not a member and you're, and you're seeing this, go to lluniversity.com, fill out the contact form. It will get to me, and uh, let's figure out what's going on, all right? Anything at all you need, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week with the more polished version of the thing that you didn't get this week, but you're going to get next week um, that I, uh, I know will be worth the wait. All right? Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Same time, same bat channel. Bye-bye.